I need help, Lord. Holy nation. All right. Holy nation. Come on. Come on. Uh, thank you, God, for this time. Thank you, God, for this connection. Thank you, God, that we have another opportunity to glorify you, to hear from you, because we know you are infinite and never ending. There is never, you don't have a down day. There's mm -hmm. never a day where you don't have something powerful to say, where you don't have something good to give us, and you never run out. And that's why we are so glad that you are our Father, and we are your children, and Jesus, you are our Savior. You are both God and man, and we only are connected to Father because of your broken body and shed blood. So be in the midst of this conversation. Please get the glory out of all things. Let the revelations of the Holy Spirit come forth, that all that watches this video might be edified, and that you might be glorified, and that the demons might be terrified, and that sinners would be mortified to live without you one more day. We thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, y'all. Tonight, I have the pleasure to interview, to listen to some ministry from, to talk to uh, prophet, apostle, pastor, John Veal. Uh, God put this in my heart a while ago because, and I think the timing of the Lord, again, is perfect. We want to seek God for understanding of what has happened before and revelation on what's about to come. So I'm very excited to welcome uh, John Veal to the show. Welcome, Brother Veal. Amen, amen. Uh, excited to be with you, Brother Taylor. Excited about uh, what's going to happen today. I'm just excited about it. Excited to be on, on with you, honored. Amen, amen. Yes. First thing I want to hit you with is, especially for people that have been struggling, how would you describe ministry pre-COVID, and post-COVID, because the entire world has changed. What has been your experience with that? Because I know you were traveling a lot, even in the pandemic. I don't know, you got to see a lot of places. Well, I would say we, we kind of leaned over to more venues like this, you know, doing more things online, because I wasn't an online guy. I didn't like Facebook Live and doing videos and all that. But, but COVID, the, with the shelter in place, the pandemic, forced me to kind of do it. And, and it was a blessing to do it. I mean, I still need to do more. People are still asking. They say, well, we, what about the online service? I just, since we've been back, I don't want people to fall back into just being online. We need to get back into the house of God. But I would say that, yeah, it, it changed us forever. I mean, it just, you know, where we've had to go to avenues that we weren't comfortable with. I wasn't comfortable with doing Facebook Live. So, I mean, yeah, I think that has been a shift that I think will never go back to the normal. I mean, we see all kinds of people doing online ministry, which is wonderful, doing Facebook lives, doing uh, online things. I think it's really great because I think you can reach a greater amount of people as well, uh, depending on the platform, depending on how far the reach is. So, yeah, I mean, I think that that I think people even coming out of COVID, you said post COVID, mm -hmm. I believe they'll be more honest, especially the prophets. I think they'll tell really the truth more so than than just saying things to make people feel good. Because I literally saw prophets going in the caves that missed some things uh, in 2020, right? And I saw a reemergence of these same prophets that will come out more honest, more in tune with God, and willing to say what God says, regardless of losing a platform or opportunity. That's what I really saw. So in a way, COVID-19 ends up being kind of a good thing to a certain degree, as far as prophetic ministry, as far as prophets really going before the face of God, getting a word from him and speaking that word without compromise. I believe that's one of the best things to come out of this whole pandemic. Now, you said a lot right there. You said a lot right there. Uh, being more honest, being yes. more accurate. Um, I've been saying for a while, if you just read Isaiah and Jeremiah, come on. if you read any of the minor prophets, uh, if you read Amos, Amos wasn't even a prophet. Amos was a shepherd. Yeah. But you will see what happens when a nation was backslidden, when a nation was under judgment, and someone called by God had to stand up and say that. Mm -hmm. So by you talking about honesty and not 
what I call Dr. Feelgood sermons. <laughs> right. Dr. Okay. Feelgood prophetics. But if the Lord yes. has a hard word about us being more willing to uh, release that word, because mm-hmm. I've discovered that uh, as well, is that, you know, this thing is a choice between life and death, not life and neutral. Come on. And maybe we have leaned more towards trying to be softer or appease the ears of the listeners. Yeah. Well, everybody likes, everybody enjoys being liked. You know, you put up a post to encourage, you like getting likes and people, you know, oh, amen. Yeah, that's wonderful. But we have to remember balance. Proverbs 11 and 1 says a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just way is his delight. So I think we always need to be balanced. I mean, I'm not saying be negative all the time because I believe when prophets do that, uh, they probably suffer from rejection. They're negative all the time. Everything you hear from them, everything, everything they post, everything they put up is negative, 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 negative. I believe that that spirit of rejection is in operation. So again, it should be balanced. People in the book of Corinthians, it's talking about prophecy should be used to uh, edify, exhort, and comfort. So it's very important to remember that because some people can be dogmatic in terms of the use of the prophetic and use it as a weapon, you know, prophesying bad stuff to people they don't like, you know, and yet still, you know, saying it's the word of God. But I believe that there was a purging taking place. I believe there's so many ministries during the pandemic have closed down and shut down and so many ministers have died. And I believe, you know, that has something to do with, uh, to me, uh, we're really speaking the truth and speaking the word of God. It's important that I believe God is challenging the remaining prophets and remaining ministers to really say what I'm saying and stop saying, thus saith the Lord. That's a big problem with me because so many people say, thus saith the Lord, and God didn't say it. And the reason why they say, thus saith the Lord, in the Old Testament, they had various prophets and all that weren't prophets of the Lord. They're prophets of Baal, prophets of Ashtaroth, uh, prophets of Jezebel that would say, thus said Ashtaroth, thus said Baal. And they did that to distinguish on whose God's behalf they were speaking. So that's why the, the prophets of God said, thus said the Lord. But so many people would say, thus said the Lord and God didn't say it. I never want to go to heaven. And God said, well, you kept saying, thus said the Lord. I didn't say half the stuff you were saying. So I don't want to get in trouble with the Lord, right? So we just have to be totally accurate, really saying what God says. Right, right, right. And that takes, uh, there's no substitute for time with him. We have to have time in the word. We have to have time in his presence. We have to know his voice. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things I learned about prophesying is stop talking when the Holy Ghost stopped talking. (laughs) That if the spirit of God is saying what he had to say, then I don't have nothing else to say. So I had to learn that early on. Now tell me this, in your travels and in your experience, do you see the same hunger for the prophetic? Do you see when you go to different places, are, are people still wanting? Is it, is it even deeper hunger? What's your perspective on that? Yeah, I do see that, but they've been, gotten so tired of, of the false, you know, getting the false. The prophet comes in once a year, takes a, takes a big offering, uh, <laughs> gets people to give a whole bunch of money and they never see him again. What is needed is prophetic training, prophetic Presbytery, prophetic uh, uh, council, prophetic ministers. I mean, you need that within the church. Now, not being out of balance, you need all the fivefold. But in terms of prophetic ministry, uh, you're not a prophetic church if you don't have those things. If you just, like I said, you have somebody come in once a year and that's it, you're not a prophetic ministry. And it goes beyond prophecy because everyone that prophesies is not necessarily a prophet. In my book, Supernaturally Prophetic, I talk about that. Talk about I have a chapter where I say you are inherently prophetic. And I believe everyone has prophetic DNA. I can prove it. I mean, there are times you'll say something or someone will say something that say they're not a prophet and it's accurate. They'll, they'll say, well, oh, girl, you told me this and it just happened. Or you told me something in the past. You gave me a great word of knowledge and they weren't even trying to. So I believe that we have prophetic DNA where we can prophesy again, but that does not make us prophets. But so many people will be able to prophesy and they'll start a school, the charging $99.99 to be a part of it <laughs> and it's enor- enormous registration fees because they can prophesy, you know, uh, but anybody can do that. Anybody can prophesy. So based on that, let me ask this. What do you think are some of the most important things in terms of foundation for the prophetic? That's funny. I was just talking to one of my leaders about this today. I say, you know, she says, well, you know, someone's asking, why do you repeat so much? Mm-hmm. And she told her, told the other person who was asking, she said, well, that's how he gets you to understand. She said, I can teach it now. I mean, my leaders and my people in my church have been with me some, some years. They can teach the prophetic because I go over the foundation over and over and over again. It's just like a basketball player. Before mm-hmm. they can become great, they have to be foundationally sound. 
So they had to go over foundations and rep it to Kobe Bryant. Did all he would take moves and just do them hundreds of times to perfect them. And so that's what it is with the prophetic, because people would invite me to their churches. And I said, well, what level to train on the prophetic? As I said, what level are you people on? Oh, they're advanced. They're advanced. I said, well, you know, I'll ask them simple questions like who was the first prophet in the Bible? Who was the first one mentioned? Who was actually the first one in the Bible? How, what's the difference between a major and minor prophet? You know, say these things that they didn't even know. They didn't. So I would start from the beginning. And I heard a woman of God. Well, a friend of mine told me a woman of God that I know said this. You always start with foundational type things. You go in to train on the prophetic. Start with the basics. Oh, well, I know that already. No, you can never get enough of hearing the basics. Because when you have that solid foundation, you can build off of that with deeper prophetics. Okay. Hey, that's really, really good. Uh, really, really important to understand that uh, in our walk because I'm still, see, what's resonating most with me is honesty and accuracy because that means we have something to compare it to that maybe we weren't all the way honest or maybe we weren't all the way accurate or maybe we yes. didn't know as much as we thought we should know. And what you're saying is how to get that solid to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost, to be accurate and to tell people what God is really saying. Mm -hmm. Uh, because sometimes you might not say anything. <laughs> mm -hmm, true. And uh, true. sometimes we have to say that too, that, you know, I'm not hearing, so I'm not going <laughs> to make up something just because we're in a prophetic line or just because you want me to wave my hand and do something, you know. Prophet, if I can add this, um, you know what I learned? It just is, and I learned this from experience. Uh, my apostle, Apostle John Eckhart, he asked me one day, he said, how do you know how to do these things? You know, and I said, well, my God, you know, I didn't have you <laughs> at the <laughs> beginning of my prophetic ministry. And what I've learned is that when you stand before people as a prophet, as a prophet, you can give them, you can always give them some type of word, but it, it, you may not be able to give them always a word of prophecy. Now, you know, the components, word of knowledge, word of wisdom and prophecy. Mm -hmm. Word of knowledge is something about the past or the present. Word of wisdom is advice or divine guidance. You know, and of course, prophecy is referring to the future. So I always tell people, I can give you one of those three things at any time. I can give you, I can tell you something about your past. I can tell you something about your future, I can tell you something about, you know, or give you uh, prophetic guidance or divine guidance. So mm -hmm. that's how I always look at it. And I, I learned that from experience because I was always able, because I used to say, okay, you know, you get there. And now I will say this, when I get in front of people, sometimes God has a lot to say, mm -hmm. but sometimes God has very little to say. Mm -hmm. And God may lead me to pray for them. So there are times like that, but I can usually, you know, give them one of those three things. Okay. Uh, what I've been seeking God about is manifestations of his power, mm. uh, things that we see in the scriptures. And yes. the reason that I've been led that way is because I've seen it happen in my family. Yes. We've seen the miraculous happen. Yes. Uh, people being healed without surgery. They were going into surgery. All right. We cried out to God and God healed and rearranged organs where the doctor said they couldn't believe what they were seeing. Mm. And I'm not talking about like five years ago. I'm talking about like five months ago. Recently. So, yes. Yeah. So I've been seeking God about that very thing. Mm -hmm. But one thing I've had to learn and accept mm -hmm. is that you better throw away your expectation. Come on. You better not fall in <laughs> love with an idea or an image. Mm -hmm. You better stay open to. And the thing about it is, is that stuff is actually scriptural. Mm -hmm. When God told Abraham he's going to be the father of many nations, I'm sure mm -hmm. that didn't end up looking like what he thought. I'm Not sure he didn't think that meant I'll be 100 before I fathered that child. <laughs> right. Exactly. And I have learned that that if you're talking about healing, you're talking about miracles like Naaman and his mm -hmm. leprosy. Yes. You can't, you can't have you can't be married to this idea in your head about mm -hmm. how God has to do it. Mm -hmm. If the Lord say he's going to do it, he's going to do it his way. He's going to do it. That's right. And I've discovered that it's even more of a taking up a, of a cross and dying to oneself. It's even more of a, again, not falling in love with a method. Mm -hmm. uh, now, have you experienced that, that people come to you and they, they have like a method in mind, like they want you to give them a prosperity wave and they want you to give them a handkerchief and all that? Or... <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I prophesied as one lady. I was telling them all this stuff that God gave me, all was accurate. You ain't say nothing about my ex-husband. What well, God didn't show me that. I mean, you know, this is not Burger King. In my book, Supernatural Prepare, I talk about that. I have a chapter I talk about the Burger King mentality. You remember the slogan, have it your way. And that's what a lot of people want with the prophetic. They want it their way. I've been in places where I minister to a lot of people and 
Uh, like one person, I may give them a word that's not as, you know, encouraging as the other one. It might be a, a reprimand, a challenge, you know, a re- rebuke. And they get mad about it. And I said, I got to say what God says. And the pastor called me, well, she didn't like that. I said, pastor, I can't help what she doesn't like. I have to say what God says. And that's what more prophets need to do in this season. Stop worrying about people liking you. If you're really a prophet, you're going to go through what folk don't like you. Your messages may not be popular, you know, because a lot of people don't want to hear truth. I was on a, um, I was get, kind of being interviewed. I was talking about this today and I didn't realize it, but this one wanted me to be in this conference with Ron Lestrange and some other people. And uh, I was like, you know, I know I was auditioning, but she had me on this line. I was speaking to her people and mm-hmm. I was very honest. I'm saying what God said. I wasn't offensive. I was just honest. And then she goes back and she says, well, I don't like his flow, you know, and the woman of God and I, I'm, I was her mentor. She tells me, she said, prophet, you told the truth. Everything you said was accurate and she did not like it. And it's a shame. That's a doggone shame mm-hmm. that we have leaders in the body of Christ that don't want the truth. If you hate the truth, you hate Jesus. Jesus calls himself the truth. So if I hate truth, I hate Jesus. But I, you know, I may not like truth, but I can respect truth. If you really tell me something that's honestly, you know, from your heart and you mean well, I can respect that even though I don't like it. That's really, really well said. Now, pivoting from that, how do you find sometimes the marriage of the apostolic and the prophetic? Because I still find at least in my experience, I have to always go back to basics to even explain that God said five, but we said three. Mm-hmm. So we're, the many churches are still trying <laughs> to function off the evangelical, the pastoral, mm-hmm. and the teaching. Mm-hmm. And they don't even know that it's a fivefold ministry, that you are not going to get the fullness. Mm-hmm. So how do you find when you're trying to present the marriage of the apostolic and the prophetic, when you're trying to minister as a sent one and trying to lay foundation and trying to, uh, because prophetically, sometimes we have to tear up that old stuff. We end up tearing up stuff. But Mm -hmm. how do you find the marriage of the two? And are people receptive to that? I think the two should work hand in hand. I mean, I believe uh, if you think about it in the old Testament, uh, the prophets were the apostles of the old Testament. I mean, you look at Samuel and Saul's relationship. Sam was telling Saul what to do. Saul was king, right? Yeah. Saul, Sam, Saul, Saul tried to do his work, Sam's job, and Sam came late, and he rebuked Saul. Saul didn't do what God told him to do, and he rebuked Saul. And then that's when God said he wasn't going to be with him anymore. And Saul wanted uh, Samuel to go out with him for appearances, and Sam was like, no, nah, you know? <laughs> and in the New Testament, prophets were the one that sent out apostles. I think a lot of people uh, neglect or overlook the power of a prophet. Once the apostolic office became popular, everybody and their mama wanted to be apostle. You look up, they were a pastor, or they weren't even part of the fivefold. But next month, they were chief apostle, master prophet, all these other things. And it's about title fights, and it's not God. And that's, that's you know, I was in the church, and man, I, I probably shouldn't say, but I was in the church, and I was talking about people being chief apostles and master prophet. They come to find out the host husband is a chief apostle. I felt so bad. <laughs> it's like I was preaching against it. I didn't know, you know, but, but one of the great books, I think uh, at least about a shift from the pastoral to the apostolic. And I had to mention, this, this is a great book by John, John Eckhart. It's called a shift in leadership. One of the best books I've ever read about shifting from the pastoral to the apostolic. What they talk about, what he talks about is basically how it should really be apostles that are really, you know, in the churches. Right. Mm-hmm. And there should be pastors like under them over ministries within the church that kind of paradigm, that kind of, um, you know, that kind of organization. Mm-hmm. And when I read it, it really opened my eyes to some things I never thought about, but I've never been into titles. I believe that the work should be what proves who you are. Cause yeah. Jesus said, if you, if, if you don't believe I'm the father, believe for the work's sake, you know? Yeah. And so I've always had that philosophy. I don't worry about telling my title saying who I am. I believe I just do the work. You'll call me what you see. But I believe apostles and prophets should definitely work hand in hand. Um, they're needed. Uh, any true ap- apostle or true apostolic ministry would have a prophetic dimension. I believe true apostles have some kind of strong prophetic acronym. Acumen- so where they, you know, they can say X, Y, Z and prophesy and do this and do that. But I truly believe this is my thought is that I believe prophets should train up prophets in the Old Testament. That's who trained up the prophets. And we have no curriculum. We have no lesson plan to see how they did it. We have to do it through revelation in terms of training prophets today. But I truly believe that, that when apostles get, they get together with prophets, prophets should be the ones raising up prophetic sons and daughters. 
Now, I agree with that wholeheartedly. When you study the New Testament, there was no major player in the New Testament that didn't have strong vision. Mm -hmm. Peter had strong vision that completely changed an entire life of religious training to move from you can't even sit with the Gentiles to now they're your brother and your sister. Right. Apostle Paul didn't have anything but strong revelation. Mm -hmm. Uh, John, the revelator, got Mm -hmm. the revelation, seeing what Jesus is doing now. Mm-hmm. And so without that strong vision, and the funny thing about it is, uh, I don't know how to say it, but uh, Apostle Eckhart has said it. He said, mm-hmm. he doesn't want to go to a church where ain't no glory. Right. And when he, he says it all the time. time. I, I, just, I just marinated yes. on that. I was like, man, because yes. when you grow up underneath anointing, you know what it is. Mm-hmm. And when the Lord's presence is, is in the room, it's unmistakable. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. you can't fake the Holy Ghost. Absolutely. But, but uh, building on that, I'm like, but see, without... Without a vision, what are the resources for? Mm-hmm. Why are you raising offerings? Why, why are you doing yes. what you're doing? What are you driving for? Is it yeah. is it global uh, evangel- uh, evangelism? Is it continued mm-hmm. buildings? As you know, because you have you'll have some type of ministry. Like my thing is always food. Mm-hmm. I don't believe in the richest country in the world that anybody should be hungry if we can all help. And so I've done food drives with uh, awesome. teen groups and. Uh, street ministry and stuff like that, because that's all kind of where my heart is. Mm -hmm. And that's also what the Lord said is one of the criteria he uses to judge us when he comes back. Come on. I'm like, how are you going to call yourself a Christian church and you ain't doing nothing that Christ care about? I can't, I can't reconcile with that. That's So uh, here's what I want to throw out at you in terms of revelations moving forward. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you can share that God has revealed about 2022 that we need to get our our radar in tune with. You know, it's funny. I was doing an uh, interview with a a host from London about a week or two ago. And he asked me a similar question about what do you see for 2022? And I told him, honestly, I said, I see things getting worse. Honestly, just to be totally honest. But what I did see, the caveat with that was basically that God's going to protect his people like he did in 2020. So I believe that God can prosper his people. God can strengthen his people. And he will do this just like he did in 2020. Um, because I remember throughout 2020, I just declared and decreed over our church. I did online to everybody that was listening. I spoke that God will make you fruitful in the land of affliction. You will prosper through this pandemic, not on the pandemic, but through it. And everybody did. We even prospered. And I wasn't even planning for it. I was just, I was speaking it over them, you know, of course, speaking over my family. And some things happened with us that were amazing. You know, how God supernaturally just increased us. So it was, it was really amazing. So I do believe that, that something like COVID isn't going nowhere. It's not going anywhere. It's not going to disappear. Like some people said, it will be with us going into 2022. I believe as it gets colder, it's going to get, especially in Chicago and other nations, again, it's going to get worse, but God will see us through. That's where our hope lies. God will keep us. And so that's what I, I need people to understand, but we have to understand this as well. There's, a powerful thing called a decree mm-hmm. in Job 22 and 28. It says, if you decree a thing, it should be established and light shall shine upon your ways. So I studied that and it said, one version says of the Bible says, if you decide on the thing, right, mm-hmm. it will be established. So I believe we have to decide and make a decision to make decrees, godly decrees that line up with scripture and speak them like crazy. I've seen this happen. I said, when I was on Sid Roth, I talked about that. You know, I talked about how the centurion soldier basically said, you know, he wouldn't even let Jesus come in under his roof. He said, speak the word only and my servant will be made whole. Right. And it happened that self same hour. When would the issue of blood? She said, if I may touch the hem of this garment, that's a statement. Right. Yeah. And, and she did it and it happened. Blind Bartimaeus, he said, oh, son of David, have mercy on me. And what he get? He got his sight back. So the difference, there's a difference between asking questions and making decrees in faith. I believe because when the centurion soldier did it, Jesus said, never have I seen such great faith. No, not in all of Israel. He made a statement based on his belief. So I believe that even as we go through 2022 and it looks worse, it looks whatever, hold on to the word of God. Let it be your foundation. Speak the word, speak faithful decrees. And I believe it will be as you say. Amen and amen. Okay. Uh, last thing I want to throw out at you is I want you to expound a little bit more on, uh, because that restructuring is fascinating. And I think that Because the revelation I got is that when we are not in our place in Christ, we are bones out of joint. Come on. So the head of the church is trying to walk and move, 
Mm-hmm. But he's got his body arguing with him. Yes. And in mm-hmm. our natural uh, situation, that's uh, a form of epilepsy. That's a uh, bones out of joint. It's mm-hmm. a malady mm-hmm. when the brain is giving signals. Yes. But the body's not responding properly. And, and that struck me very much what you said about what Apostle Eckhart said. So going forward, mm-hmm. like in the way you have your church structured, like how would you like to see that in terms of the fivefold ministry? Like if you could build a church and establish that new uh, structure, what would that look like? Well, I try to eliminate all the schisms, the competition. And we know in Chicago, it's trem- tremendously competitive. The and it's not competitive. In apostles, the- yeah. Right. <laughs> The false apostle capital of the world. That's what Apostle uh, Clifford Turner called it, what to call Chicago one time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, really, I mean, because everybody in their mom is an apostle, everybody in their mom is a prophet. Um, no one wants to align with anybody else. It's all about platform. And that bothers me. That bothers me to no end. It's about celebrity. I mean, you see these, you know, you see these videos and uh, worldly songs are going on and, and, you know, all these selfies and all this stuff. I mean, I'm not knocking people that do, but I'm saying it's becoming more of a celebrity type thing, more so than a godly type thing, you know, and that bothers me. And I wonder if we can all come on one accord. It, it's going to be very, very difficult because people have different agendas. There's some people that are leading that should not be leading. They were not called to lead. You know, they, they, it's all about, you know, getting money, getting seen, getting platform. And that's what's so bothersome. I think that needs to stop. I think we need to really have true repentance. I think we need to put our sackcloths on and, and start fasting again. I think a lot of leaders are not fasting like they should. We're not praying like we should. And when's the last message you heard about hell? When's the last message you heard about somebody, you know, if you don't stop sinning, you're going to go to hell a message. You know, I mean, we don't hear those anymore. We hear you're all right. I'm all right. You're going to be a millionaire. This is you're going to be blessed. You're going to be this, that and the other. And God is not saying that all the time. So, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, when I'm prophesying, even if you don't like God is not saying good things all the time. Now, and there's no scripture. There's no scripture I've ever seen that says God is nice. In fact, they say God is terrible, you know, and I mean, terrible in a good way. But God has a personality. God laughs. God gets angry. And he that, that laughter or anger is reflected in his prophets, in his mouthpieces, in the, the leaders. And so we have to start speaking that and not worrying about hurting people's feelings or people leaving our church getting upset. I think we have to preach and minister with a freedom, especially after COVID-19, after all that, you know, we're looking at somebody's been talking about Russia and China are getting together to attack us. You look at what's going on with Russia right now. And the president just went over there to warn them about sanctions, about invading another country and doing these things. I mean, we could be on the brink of World War III. There are much more important things to, to uh, talk about or really get into instead of leaders always, you know, uh, competing with each other, getting angry with each other. Oh, I don't believe in this. And you don't believe in that. You don't believe. It's just hard to come into a harmonious way. I'm hoping that that happens, but I mean, to me, it's not likely to happen, sad to say, but um, that's what's needed. A unity among the believers, among, among the leaders that, that follow Jesus. But we've got to get on one accord to see major, major change. Okay, you said so much there. I got to respond to it. Uh, first of all, uh, the the message is cars and houses and private airplanes. The scripture is you have to take up your cross. Come on, that's what the right. Lord said. He said that's the first thing you have to do. Yes. So the easiest part about being saved is mm-hmm. getting saved. Come on, because that was about Jesus taking up His cross, and all you have to do is stand there and receive it. Come on, that's good. But if yes. you're gonna follow Him. Then you mm-hmm. got to take up your cross. And I don't hear that. See, I grew up with people like that. I grew mm. up with people preaching, teaching, no cross, no crime. Mm, I grew up on. with people saying that if you ain't yes. living nothing, that God ain't going to hear your prayer. Yep. You know what I'm saying? So I grew <laughs> up too. old school. But yes. now those messages about dying to self, I mean, if any prophet would even tell the truth, you go through fire, you go through purging, mm. you go mm. through correction, you go yes. through a humbling. You go through a whole lot of stuff if God's going to trust you with his word in your mouth. Yes. Because that's a dangerous thing if it's undisciplined. That's right. So, And don't nobody ever grow up and say, I want to grow up and be a prophet. Mm -mm, I never did. I'll grow up and be a pastor. I never Never heard anybody say, I want to grow up and be a prophet because God don't ask me. (laughs) Never. So so I'm saying all I have to say, it it seems that we've gotten so far away from the cross, Mm -hmm. from self-denial, from not my will, but thine be done. Exactly. Number one, but number two, also, uh, again, extrapolating on what you were saying, um, 
Well, let me put it like this. Old school. If you're in the basement playing with your siblings or your cousins mm -hmm. and your grandfather opened the door and said, y'all kids making too much noise down there. Cut that noise out. Mm -hmm. If you know anything about old school, Papa ain't going to say that but one time. That's right. <laughs> if he have to come down there, <laughs> you he talking. coming down there with something in his hand and he's not going to be talking. Mm -hmm. That's right. This That's is right. the way I feel because you mentioned it earlier about churches dying on the vine and people leaving early. This is kind of the way I feel. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm I'm scared of daddy. I want when daddy come down here to judge, he come has on. a winnowing fan. He he clearing out stuff he don't come like. On. Come on. So I I want to try to live so that when you look at me, I can get a well done. Mm -hmm. Because if your grandfather start whipping your cousins and you laugh, he's going to turn to his wrath from them to you. <laughs> right. That's true. And so that's kind of what I feel I like, like is that. happening. I'm just so glad mm -hmm. you say that because very rarely do I hear it mm -hmm. on a larger scale that so much what we've experienced in the last two years mm -hmm. is very much analogous mm -hmm. to some people got to the edge of the promised land and didn't believe God any further. Mm -hmm. So God is like, you not go, you can't go any further because you only believe me to the wilderness. Mm -hmm. You don't mm -hmm. believe me in the promised land, and then you're gonna wander in the wilderness till you die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, also something you tapped into, and that is that uh, we'll just touch on it briefly because we're about to wrap up. But mm -hmm. the fact that the prophetic comes, some prophets are local prophets assigned to a church. Yes, some prophets are assigned to a city. Mm -hmm. Some prophets are assigned to a region. Yes. Some are assigned to a nation and then some are signed, assigned internationally, internationally. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another thing about the prophetic that doesn't mm -hmm. get talked about enough. Yes. Because you're so, you're so busy trying to, like you said, get a title or be a name or whatever. But mm -hmm. what if God is telling you, your focus is that particular house mm -hmm. and the revelations you get are going to be, you know, about that house are not going to be because you mentioned Russia and China, because you travel the nations, and God gives you vision and revelation and understanding on that level. Mm -hmm. But I think that I think that if we fall back in love with Jesus and just do it because we love the Lord, mm -hmm. then it won't be about mm -hmm. you know comparing or you know or crowds or numbers or followers. You know what I'm saying? Because we didn't we Absolutely. didn't let social media start mm -hmm. to dictate our worth. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you feel like that. You put a video up and you get 50 views and you're like, what's going on? You know, <laughs> but I, I had to start getting out of it. I think that taught me some things within when I was doing online, because I start off, I get like 200, 300 views and went up to a, a thousand. So I started shooting for a thousand. Every time I get on, I wanted a thousand views and I would get a more a thousand, fifteen hundred. It started to go up to two thousand, three thousand. Then all of a sudden, it went down to like. But well, after the pandemic, kind of the shelter in place was kind of over. <laughs> down to like a couple hundred. Every now, be six, seven hundred, whatever. And I got this kind of like, what's going on, you know? But that's all flesh, you know. That's really flesh. And I think that you do need some ambition to push towards certain things, right? You, I mean, you need a drive. You need some kind of drive, but you cannot let that drive replace who God is in your life. You got to be willing to say what God says. I, I made a post and I made a video about the prophets missing it in 2020. I won't say too much again about that because they take down this video, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, you say anything about it, it's taking stuff down. But I, I made, I, I did a video. I did an article for, um, I think I did it for a uh, charisma magazine or something. I, I was doing, I just talking about how the prophets just need to say they missed it. I mean, if you miss a word, don't try to force feed the word down somebody's throat. If you miss God, just say you miss God. Mm -hmm. And our Lauren Sanford, God rest his soul, just passed away not long ago. Uh, Chris Ballantyne and um, uh, my friend Jeremiah Johnson, um, they were bold enough to say, hey, I missed it. Because I'll start saying it because they were some of these people were saying, you don't have to say you missed anything. I said, no, you do have to. If you publicly declare that a certain person will win an election or this is going to happen or whatever it is. You need to publicly declare and say, I missed it when it doesn't happen. I had, I've lost opportunities because people reach out. Well, we saw your post and we, you know, we didn't like it. So you can't do this. You can't do that. I thought it was absolutely ridiculous. I said, I never bashed Trump. I prayed for Trump, never said who was going to win the election. I said, next to Sid Roth, they were talking about Trump and everything. I said, nothing. I mean, we were eating lunch. I said nothing. I made no predictions because I figured whoever wins, that's who God wants in office. So I never did that. But I've lost platforms. I lost certain things because of what I would say. But I believe as a prophet of God, you have to say what God says. 
If not, why are you a prophet of God? Right. What's the point? Yeah. If we're not going to release the word of God. Be a prophet of yourself. Be a prophet for you. You know, don't be a prophet of God. Don't say you're a prophet of the Lord. You know, because I say this real quick. Half the stuff I see on Facebook, I'm serious. I see a lot of that stuff. I just don't believe it's God. I believe it's flesh. And, and you know, I'm one that tries to be balanced. I won't call it a prophetic word. I call it a prophetic declaration or a word for somebody. So this is not prophecy. I'm trying to encourage you. But some people have prophetic words and say, this is God. This is not. I mean, the whole point of prophetic word is this should come from God. You know, but God is not going to tell you every every other word, every other week that you're going to be a millionaire. <laughs> you know, it's been 20 years later. You're still waiting. Did you make a million in your whole career, your whole life? When is this two million coming? You know, I got a lot of stories about that. I'm sorry. I'm good. You got me going now. You said that. I'm, I'm ready I know. To go that's now. all right. That's what we need to hear <laughs> because... Because iron sharpens iron. It's the thing that helps us go back before the Lord. Because uh, I always say prophets draw a line there in the sand. Mm That's how you were before you heard the word and then how you are after. Everything I read in the scripture shows a before and after. And so you're talking about the difference between a prophetic word or prophetic declaration. If the Holy Spirit of God is saying something, it's going to happen. If it takes 400 years. That's right. It's going to come to pass. That's right. And and if the Holy Ghost says something is conditional, then there'll be an if, like in Deuteronomy 28. Right. If exactly. You if he, right. You say, exactly. Like you said, like you started off saying, if the Holy Ghost say, thus saith the Lord, that's not mm-hmm. negotiable. Mm-hmm. That's not votable. Mm-hmm. It means this fitting to happen. Mm-hmm. So, I, I'm sorry, can I say this real quick? Yes. The whole thing, too, is like, I mean, if you, you you speak word on the Lord's behalf, it should come to pass, right? Mm-hmm. If you, when I was talking about thus saith the Lord and all that stuff, but there are so many people that said God said something that didn't happen. But I wanted to just say this: um, that doesn't make them false prophets. It's a it's a scripture in Deuteronomy that says if a prophet said, I'm paraphrasing, mm-hmm. prophet says something and doesn't come to pass, you don't have to be afraid of them. That same prophet was presumptuous. So I believe there are a lot of presumptuous prophets that say things that think God said and, and really mean well. The false prophets are the one that purposely mislead. They purposely come for the uh, uh, sole reason of getting money and, and, and celebrity and platforms. And we see a lot of these people, but guess what? I believe God is taking these people down. He's allowing them to, to you know, go somewhere. You know, I'm not saying necessarily mm-hmm. die, but just go off the scene and all that, because I really believe that God is cleaning house. It's going to continue into 2022 where a lot of false prophets, you're not going to see them anymore. You're not going to hear from them because I believe God is shutting the mouths of those false prophets because they misled his people. They continue to mislead his people and his grace gives them, gives them that time to repent. But I believe if they don't repent, their, their, their power, their level, and we've seen it already. We've seen it happen even now. Their level of celebrity or influence starts to, to dwindle. And I believe that's going to happen more and more because we need true words from the Lord. If we ever needed a true word from God, it's right now. And I believe there are prophets that are emerging, they're coming up that we've never heard of, that will have a word in their spirit that will resonate and be real and, and it'd be God. And you know it's God because it will convict you, it will, it will strengthen you, it will encourage you. It do all those things. But right now, people just want to hear what they want to hear. They'll go to, can I say this real quick? They'll, they'll go to clubs, right? They'll, these churches will have clubs where they're twerking. I saw a video. They, women were twerking. This is a church event. Twerking. They had a, a bar. But they had alcohol serving. I mean, they had like the black lights, right? I mean, I have the video. Somebody sent me the video. And some people I knew were in there doing that. You don't do that. What is happening? Holy, you don't have no party where you drink, getting drunk and twerking and listen to worldly music. I'm like, wonder what is going on with the body? I mean, it's becoming more and more like the world and these churches that attract people, they're doing these things because they go to one church that believes in holiness and, and correction and all that. The people get mad, but I'm going over here because I can do what I want. And that's what they want. It's a Burger King mentality. Have it my way. But is it God's way? That's what we have to ask ourselves. That's powerful, Prophet. Okay, we're going to call it right there because I see we could talk for two more hours. But We could. <laughs> we're going to call that one. But I definitely <laughs> want to have you back on. And sure. uh, thank you so much for uh, making time for the interview. I'm going to uh, meditate on the stuff you released because I think it's powerful. A lot of that stuff is resonating with my spirit. And so I want to meditate on it some more and have the Holy Ghost give me some more revelation about order, about structure, about separation from the mm-hmm. world, about uh, not being about a platform. Everything you said, I think, was really powerful. And I'm hoping that my audience can resonate with that, too, because, because 
uh, just to, you know, we're talking about being honest, just to be blunt. Mm -hmm. We are in uh, days of Noah time where the mm -hmm. end of some flesh has come up before God. Come on. And only being in the ark of safety is actually going to allow your family to survive. Come we on. are in yes. uh, 10 plagues of Egypt time where God is judging that which is worldly and God is yes. judging that which is false. Yes. And the death angel is here and there's a whole lot of blood in the streets. So you got to put the blood on your doorposts mm -hmm. to sanctify mm -hmm. your family. And even if, because yes. uh, we just talked about that in my family chat, even if you're the younger generation don't understand what you're doing. I didn't understand when I was a child, but I heard the old folks plead the blood. I didn't understand that, but I understand it now. And, and so we're in that kind of time. And that to me is the biggest pain of my heart is the lack of recognition of where we are. That is rain and judgment. And you don't know how long you might have. So you have to get in the ark so you can survive that plagues are coming back to back, to back to back. And God is looking for the blood of Jesus over your life. You got to get under the blood and stay under the blood. And that stuff you were just saying about about mixed thing. That's when the Lord sent his hand down to the party and stripped the king because he took the vessels dedicated to God's service and treated them like they was common. And God said, you've been weighed in the balance and found warning. Now your kingdom stripped from you. We're in that kind of time. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest heaviness in my heart that I don't hear. I don't hear enough people trying to help people understand, mm -hmm. you know, that that's the kind of time we're in. And so it's, it's not, it's not a joke. It's not a game. So again, I just want to thank you so much. Let's close with a word of prayer. Sure. Uh, why don't you close us out with a word of prayer? Father God, we just thank you for this time of dialogue. We pray that the people that watch this will be blessed tremendously. And we bind every spirit that comes against them to try to stop them in their uh, upward elevation within the Lord. Father God, we just pray that these words really resonate with them and stir something up on the inside of them to burn, to kind rekindle that fire on the inside for them to uh, desire the things of God and even ministers that are on to speak the word of God without uh, uh, any, any reservation to say what God is saying and not be afraid of what platform they could lose or what celebrity status they could, they could lose. Father God, we just speak and declare over everyone watching right now that the, the, the bomb of Gilead, the oil of God will pour upon them. Father God, they will be like fire. Hallelujah. It'd be like fire. Kabadeshi is shut up in their bones, Father. They will have such a desire for the true things of God, and they will be able to discern the false. And we speak and declare this now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen.